as you know, um, I have been uh, watching and following the conversation uh, and I've been reluctant to, to join in in any specificity. Uh, even though, of course, I was part of the process to help to persuade the Cornell to move from uh, the People's Party to the Green Party and was part of what uh, we loosely refer to as the uh, the Brain Trust. Uh, so I found it uh, quite distressing when uh, I saw some of the commentary uh, that was taking place for various reasons. One, on the personal level, but secondly, on the political level, that it appeared that some of the criticism that he was advancing was making it very difficult for the possibility of some kind of reconciliation, if you will, some kind of a working together of uh, two viable uh, left or radical uh, campaigns here in this country. Uh, so I felt it better not to say anything at that time. But it appears that the uh, implications continue. Uh, and so I felt compelled to uh, come back and to, to talk about some of these issues. For example, uh, in your, your setup, you talked about, and I saw the program last week uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Stein, and these, these allusions to some kind of uh, racial politics in the Green Party that uh, in some way were imposing themselves on the West campaign. Well, uh, quite frankly, when I first heard that, it was news to me because I didn't know anything about that. And then Dr. Stein pointed out, you know, the a campaign has an independent character. And, uh, and as Cornell has said more than once, he's an independent Black man. So the politics that were developing to define his campaign uh, was a politics that, of course, had a, an element of race connected to class, that uh, this, there's no elements that we knew of in the Green Party that would be opposed to that. So the implication that, and it was part of the justification he tried to advance to explain why he left the Green Party, uh, that there's some kind of issue with the question of race is just not accurate. It's, it's just, it's, it's a distortion. And it's, it, there was issues like that. Uh, I don't, I didn't know anything about them. Have you ever felt kind of separate and apart from the Dr. West campaign in this latest cycle that the racial politics within the Green Party were unsatisfactory to you? Did you feel any of that sort of pressure around your 2016 campaign, for example? No, not at all, because our campaign was a campaign that was a, a radical campaign. We were advancing at that moment a, a radical agenda uh, that had uh, uh, references to, to race connected to class. And I always include that uh, because I, I don't like this abstraction, this race reduction, if you will, that takes place in the discourse on, on politics here in the U.S., uh, that there's some specific uh, racial uh, agenda. I, I don't know what that is. I mean, the racial agenda that uh, many of us are involved is, is an agenda for African self-determination. But people aren't talking about that. What they're talking about are uh, different forms of reformism. I'm not interested in that. So the reform that we were pushing in the context of the Green New Deal was a reform that was uh, sharpening the contradictions of the capitalist system. Okay, And so the issues that Cornell was raising and the, and the reason why we're so excited about the possibility of this campaign with similar kinds of, of, of perspectives and positions. And so there was no pushback from the, from the Green Party. When we talk about the Green Party, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. There's no monolithic Green Party. The individuals in the Green Party, there are state uh, uh, parties. Uh, there's no uh, uh, inner circle of powerful people, powerful white people that control the politics of the Green Party. Mm -hmm. The politics emanate from the campaigns as Jill pointed out. And so the notion that there was some kind of pushback on the issue of race, it was, it was almost like a smear, an a un, undeserved smear, an implication that because he was so Black that there were elements in the Green Party that felt uncomfortable with that. That's, that's not really uh, accurate. And I think Cornell knows that. 
Yeah, I got to say, excuse me, as a Black leftist, I have witnessed over the course of the years different attempts to smear leftist efforts as something that should be ignored by the mainstream or well-meaning liberals because somehow it was racist, right? I wrote a lot about race reductionism in kind of the 2018 uh, kind of post-Bernie first cycle era and how those um, these arguments were used to diminish that campaign, um, articles that got written about how student debt cancellation was racist because it was going to hurt HBCUs, how somehow Medicare for All was racist, everything was racist. We all know about the Bernie Bro narrative, et cetera. So my spidey, my spidey senses do tingle a little bit when I see left movements in particular get accused of that. However, of course, if it were true, I also have an interest in knowing about that, which is why I really had an interest in talking to you as someone who I trust and who I think is really credible on these kinds of things. I mean, I want to ask you, when Dr. West first made those comments on this podcast, I think it was back in February, we had a little bit of a back and forth about whether or not you wanted to come on and talk about it. You said you wanted to have an opportunity first to talk to Dr. West in person, and I, I really respect that choice. And I wonder, have you had an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with him? And has that given you any greater insight into what actually happened that motivated the choice to leave uh, the Green Party? Well, we actually had a chance to, we, uh, right after that conversation you and I had, uh, had a chance to catch up with Dr. West uh, in Houston, uh, where we had a, a program and, and uh, support Palestinians in raising money for medical supplies. So we had a chance to, in fact, talk. Uh, well, there's no mystery, uh, Brianna. I, I, I kind of know what happened. Mm. My, my, my conversation with, with uh, Dr. West was to try to kind of clear the air on my position and why I felt compelled to have to move away from his campaign. And mm. basically what we talked about was the fact that, for me, it was always about the movement and movement building, that this transcends the 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 interests and the concerns of any one individual uh and that i was concerned about a, a campaign that seemed to be overly dependent on uh his personality as opposed to uh the policies uh the positions that the campaign should be advancing and part of that one reason why that was developing in that way was because you know, there were people around uh, the campaign, uh, in the campaign, around the campaign that didn't have much history in terms of uh, building radical politics. Definitely in attempts to build uh, a third party uh, 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 approach. Um, and so we know that there were people who were in his circle, who, were, uh, who had his ear, uh, who talked about you know, the fact that it's about you because, of course, they are legal implications when you're running uh, in the bourgeois system uh, for the candidate. Um, but we were trying to make sure that Dr. West remembered and understood that this was about uh, movement building that went beyond the electoral process. And so, you know, but it seems that, that people convinced him at some point that he didn't have to submit himself to a, a, a process within the party. Uh, to win the nomination, uh, and that it was uh, a feasible to attempt to build uh, a, a so-called independent campaign. But those of us who are organizers, we understood that that was a critical error. If it was that easy, Brianna, to go out and build a third-party challenge and to actually get on the ballot in order to to in order to challenge power, then more people would do it. But here you had the apparatus, the Green Party who had uh, experience in building uh, movement and getting people on the ballot. And then you make a decision to basically disarm, dismantle your army, and you're gonna build a, a new army. It made no sense. Uh, but that, that decision, I believe, was a part of that process of him hearing, having too many Democrats around him and people not providing him the kind of critical perspective that he needed. As a member of the so-called brain trust, uh, when that conversation or series of conversations took place, uh, I knew nothing about that and neither did Jill. Uh, we heard about it like everybody else in the campaign. 
So there was a clear understanding that uh, there's a certain kind of uh, hegemonic perspective that they did not want to see challenged. And that uh, position was they're going to strike out on their own uh, and build a process to get on the campaign, to get on the ballot in all 50 states. I hear a couple of things in there I'd, I'd like to tease out if we can. I mean, one is this idea that he has too many you know, Democrats around him, people who aren't used to being part of more left movement building efforts. But that seems to be separate from the really practical question of ballot access. And that seemed to be one of the major draws. I mean, obviously, I'm a Green Party voter. voter. I voted for you. But um, one of the major draws of Dr. West being associated with the Green Party in the first place. And so even if you are, let's say, more liberally oriented, maybe even if you are a Democrat, that doesn't seem to really get to the core of the practical decision making here. It would seem to me that even if everything that has been insinuated is true, and maybe this is me, maybe this is an indictment of me, but it seems to me that even if the Green Party were pushing back against something, some some aspect of his racial um, messaging, even if it were true that um, the hoops that one has to draw uh, jump through internally to be nominated were onerous and difficult, that the advantage um, of being able to actually run and compete because of what the Green Party is able to provide in terms of ballot access would make me want to sort of white knuckle it and and push through, at least in lieu of having a war chest like RFK Jr., who has a VP who's a literal billionaire who can fund, you know, whatever signature drives or whatever are necessary for him to get him ballots all across the country. So, I mean, help me understand this. When you when you talk about feeling like the process was too difficult, I, Dr. Stein has mentioned this as well, that the internal nominating process was somehow distasteful. Can you talk us through what that process is like and also whether, you know, Dr. Stein had to go through that process as well or whether that's ongoing? Green Party is a party. And like all parties, you have to win the nomination, which means you have to uh, get the delegates, you have to win uh, the elections in the various states, uh, and you come, they come to the to the nominating convention, just like the Democrat Party and the Republican Party, and whoever has the most delegates win. So it's a process of winning the, the nomination. It's not a difficult one. It's a political process. And look, everybody who's honest they understood there was no challenger in the Green Party that would displace or Cornell West. It, it is his, the notion that he was not going to uh, win the nomination was ridiculous. But again, as a party, a principal party, uh, the nomination was not going to be just given to him. Okay, so he alludes to the fact that there was some requirements to participate in a certain number of debates. That's every election cycle for the presidential level. Jill Stein had to go through it. Everyone who's ever won the nomination had to go through it. It's interesting that when he left, uh, Brianna, he, 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 he pointed to a few people who he said had advised him that the Green Party was in the right space to be in. And he held up Ralph Nader. Mm -hmm. I thought that was ridiculous because Part of the issue with Ralph Nader was he believed in, in 2004 that the nomination should be given to him, and he failed to compete for it, and he got displaced. Okay, so but no one was going to attempt to do that in 2024. It's ridiculous, and I think Cornell understands that. So his reasoning to leave the party was was flawed, based and I believe just based on in, pure inexperience, people who who have never. Uh, engage in third party politics, who didn't have any kind of organizing sensibility, felt that just using his name, they're going to be able to build an apparatus across the country to get him on the ballot. It just doesn't work like that. We are so excited, Rihanna, because with the apparatus of the Green Party and with Cornell, I mean, can you imagine where that campaign will be at today yeah. with everything that's unfolded? Was, that's what infuriates me. It was so me. exciting. Yeah. Me. 
Yeah, I mean, and just as a voter, um, I think what's so difficult about this, I mean, the even before any discord between Dr. West and the Green Party became apparent, just the fact of him leaving immediately created dissonance for me personally, and I think a lot of people in this movement space, because now a choice has to be made between different people that we like and who whose values very much map onto ours equally. The Green Party, Jill Stein, Dr. West. This isn't like a policy debate. This isn't like I'm going to be able to look at some narrow issue area and make a decision between the two. And at the same time, there's, I think, a heightened awareness that there are certain opportunities that exist in this election cycle because of how historically unpopular both Joe Biden and Donald Trump are. You're seeing what RFK Jr. is able to do with that frustration with the two major parties. And there's a lot of like wistfulness about what might have been if if we as leftists had someone with name recognition that also had the backing of a party apparatus who's been here, who's done that, and who has done a lot of the work already. Um, so that is part of why I don't mean to harp on this, but I do think it's important to understand as someone, I got to say also, who has been urging the left to have these conversations about this election cycle for two years now. Two years ago, two summers ago, I first had, I think, a group from uh, the Revolutionary Blackout Network on just to try to move who would be a good left candidate. What could this look like? How can we start getting behind someone? Who should we recruit? What should the organizing start to look like? And it's been frustrating for me, I got to say, to watch a lot of people come at me over that, um, people not wanting to have proactive conversations, people saying, well, we got to get behind Joe Biden because Donald Trump is the worst. And a lot of those people, after two years of dogging me out and going back and forth, now all coming around to this position of we got to get behind a left candidate. And now it feels not too late, but a little late in the game as we see Jill Stein struggling to get on the ballot in, in New York, not through any fault of her own, but through the machinations of the Democratic Party and Cuomo on the way out the door, as we discussed last week. And I just, it's hard not to think of what could have been if everyone were thinking a little bit more strategically a little bit earlier on. And I don't want to put put to you, I mean, what do you make of how the state of the left and how serious people are about kind of exploiting these elections, these, these national elections for the benefit of the left project, understanding that this isn't the be all end all, of course, of the organizing that the left needs to do. But what seems to be, what feels to me to be like lost opportunities because of all of this unseriousness that seems on display in this instance, it, it kind of emblem uh, uh, that's embl emblematic of what we're talking about with the, the Dr. West campaign. You, 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 you used the term that I would uh, unite with, that is unseriousness of mm -hmm. the left in this country. Uh, we really just started having serious conversations around how uh, the left should access, relate to, exploit, utilize uh, electoral politics really over the last decade or so. And one of the reasons why we were able to open up that space of conversation to a certain extent was as a consequence of some of the experimentation that took place in places like Jackson, Mississippi, when Chokwe, mm -hmm. uh, Chokwe Lumumba first ran for city council and then ran for mayor and won. That sort of legitimized a radical, in particular among the Black left, a, a radical uh, space to, to begin to talk about what does this mean strategically, not only on the local level, but potentially on the national level. So in some ways, we're relatively uh, young, if you will, in that conversation. In 2016, we were quite clear in our messaging that basically this was about building a dual and contending power that the electoral process was a process that allowed us access to the people to bring uh, different policies and perspectives uh, to debate those out and to build structures that will allow us to contend core power, okay? The same thing this year. This is was a, a, a monumental opportunity for us to not only uh, raise the right questions, but actually contend for power. We knew that the the contradictions of this economy, uh, the uh, uh, contradictions generated uh, by the uh, amateurism reflected in the U.S. Uh, imperial policies that was blowing back on them, that there was going to be a perfect opportunity 
to take advantage of the vulnerabilities of both parties and build a left alternative. And Dr. West was the perfect candidate for that. So it's, it's you know, your agitation uh, is something that many of us have been involved in for, for, for quite some time. There's still uh, sort of a bit of ultra leftism, if you will. Uh, there's also a bit of, of pragmatism, if, if you will, which people still want to get, feel compelled to get behind uh, the Democratic Party as a break or what they see as fascism in the country. But as you know, I've been advocating, you've been advocating for a left candidate for years. I've been trying to wake people up to the fact that the leading, uh, the driving force for uh, a particular form of fascism in this country are neoliberal Democrats. The neoliberal movement operated through the Democrat Party. People forget that what was the party in which neolib neoliberalism first emerged? It was the Republican Party. But over the course of a few decades, the neoliberals have migrated into the Democrat Party. And this collusion now between the most powerful elements of the ruling class, of finance capital, uh, and the state uh, operating through the uh, Democrat Party, constricting space, for for discourse, um, uh, eliminating the possibility to to, to disseminate uh, information, censorship, uh, big tech, uh, the corporate media uh, uh, companies. Uh, this is the, this is the recipe, folks. The class recipe for fascism. But they had us diverted, looking at the clownish nature of Trump. Not saying that those elements aren't important, or aren't uh, dangerous. There are some serious fascist elements in that movement. But who controls the state or who controls the state in the United States of America? The neoliberal faction of capital. So, you know, this is a perfect, this was a perfect, it's still a perfect opportunity. This, this is only May of 2024. We still have a chance to build an alternative uh, left candidate in this country. But some uh, tough decisions have to be made. You know, there's been some, I know, conversations taking place, you know, but that's why it was so distressing to to see Dr. West raising these issues about personality, about people not being trustworthy, this and that. We see the opposition all the time. They will fight among themselves, but then they will end up unifying to advance their particular political and class interests. Why can't we have the majority to do the same? That's what is troubling me uh, at this point, and one reason why we're having this conversation. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.